Hello, I'm Tom Zuber. I'm the managing partner of Zuber Lawler. We are a law firm with, thanks to God, seven offices across the United States. And we do a lot of work in areas of technology and emerging technology, including quantum computing. I'm also a founder and I sit on the editorial board of Dead Cat Live Cat, which is an online magazine that's devoted to the subject matter of quantum computing. The purpose of Dead Cat Live Cat is, uh, well, to have a lot of fun geeking out over this incredibly interesting subject matter, uh, including uh, the notion of uh, achieving commercial uh, uses for this, uh, for this technology. And also I think to facilitate connections uh, between folks that are interested in this subject matter. So on that note, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague at Dead Cat Live Cat, Scott Dibwad. Uh, he is uh, with BLG in Canada. Scott, it's great to have you here moderating and looking forward to watching the panel myself. Well, Tom, thanks, uh, thanks for hosting us today and thank you for that introduction. And welcome everyone out there uh, joining us today. I'm Scott Dibwad. I'm a lawyer and a patent agent and quantum enthusiast with Gordon Ladner Gervais. And we're a full service law firm based in uh, Canada. And we're chock full of uh, lawyers and litigators and other uh, patent agents and technology enthusiasts such as myself. And we're certainly very excited to be getting more involved in the quantum technology space. And uh, I'm also on the editorial board for Dead Cat Live Cat, and I'm very pleased to be uh, moderating today's uh, webinar, Practical Applications in Quantum Technology, How Far Along Are We? And uh, joining us here today, I'm very excited to be welcoming our uh, esteemed uh, group of panelists. And I'll just briefly mention everyone by name, and then we'll go around and do introductions. So we have Jean-Francois Bovier, partner and director with Boston Consulting Group. We have Brian Lenahan, founder and chair of Quantum Strategy Institute, Jeremy Lastman, who's a co-founder for Quantum Star Systems, and Dr. Rob Campbell, who's chair of the Quantum Computing Research Program at Capital Technology University. And uh, on that note, we'll just go to each panelist and learn a little bit more about them. So Jean-Francois, we'll start with you, please. Okay, thank you for having me tonight. So, um, oh, sorry, today because uh, I'm speaking from France. So, uh, what can I say? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm passionate in technology. Uh, I joined BCG 20, uh, uh, 18 years ago. I started my career as a computer scientist. And um, in 2018 at BCG, we decided to create a group about deep tech because we thought it was an important topic for our clients. And uh, I volunteered to take the lead of a quantum group. Uh, since I've been there, we have published nine papers uh, on, on the market and uh, doing analysis on the different aspects. And um, we engage with clients. We engage, so basically our Fortune 500 clients, I would say, um, investors, uh, because, you know, there is, there is a lot of M&A uh, or uh, funding, as you know, in the space. Uh, and sometimes with governments asking us, you know, what to do in terms of national strategy. So it's a very exciting uh, industry to be in, and uh, I'm very happy to be here tonight, and to, sorry, today for, for those in the U.S. Great. Well, thank you, Jean-Francois. We're certainly excited to have you here today. And uh, Brian, over to you. Sure. Hi, Scott. Uh, I'm Brian Lenahan. I'm the founder and chair of the Quantum Strategy Institute, which is a not-for-profit organization, a global think tank, if you will, um, that's focused on the mission of accelerating the adoption of quantum technologies. I'm also the author of Quantum Boost, which is a book which was the origin for the Institute. Uh, my background certainly is in um, banking, a uh, lifelong career banker, but most of my work was with technology teams. And I come at this uh, quantum ecosystem from a very practical perspective. Um, less about the technology, more about what consumers are thinking, what they're, they're doing in terms of uh, using quantum technologies, whether it's sensing or communication or computing, um, and really testing the road in terms of revenues and ROIs and what the outputs are. Um, so that's very much the space that I work in. Great. Um, so certainly we're already starting to get into a few of the details of how, uh, where we can expect to find practical applications for quantum computing. So. Uh, thank you for that, Brian. And uh, Jeremy, over to you. Hello. <laughs> it's uh, great to be here. Honor to be here. My name is Jeremy Lastman. I am a uh, former uh, SpaceX technologist with Elon Musk back when uh, SpaceX was a startup. Um, I have been a, a technology enthusiast uh, for as long as I can remember. Um, and uh, basically, like, got into quantum around 
just the different understandings of what quantum can be in science, philosophy, spirituality. I kind of synthesized all of that stuff. And I'm the co-founder of Quantum Star Systems. We are making um, a software development hub and services hub uh, for quantum computing to bring quantum computing to the world. Great, well, thank you, Jeremy. We're certainly looking forward to hearing more about your holistic perspective on the space. And uh, Dr. Rob Campbell, over to you for the last word here. Uh, thank you, um, Rob Campbell. I'm currently the chair of the Quantum Computing uh, Research Program, which is a PhD program. Uh, my students engage in quantum computing research, but most often they mix it with AI uh, robotics and other topics, uh, uh, and these uh, research projects are peer-reviewed, uh, so that's how they get their PhD through uh, peer-reviewed journals. Uh, my background uh, extends some years back uh, into the military. I started off working electronics, uh, signal processing, uh, spacecraft engineering, um, you know, and uh, computer science as well, uh, quite a few years uh, in those areas. And uh, I am very, very uh, uh, enthused about the topic of quantum mechanics and quantum computing and what it offers. And so I'm just uh, thrilled uh, to be part of this today. Thank you. Great, thank you. So for the audience out there, as you can see, it's. Uh, should be an exciting discussion today. We have a real breadth of experience to draw from. And uh, with that, let's get into it. So we are here in part to try to figure out how far along are we uh, with respect to practical applications for quantum computing technology. Um, and we know we've yet to achieve uh, a quantum advantage or, or true quantum supremacy, uh, but we are seeing hybrid solutions with classical computers. Uh, so starting with that, let's go around the group and get everyone's perspe perspective on where we currently are with practical applications in the quantum uh, computing technology space. So Brian, we'll start with you. Sure. Let me just give you sort of a, a sense of what the ecosystem looks like. Today, there are over 500 vendors in hardware, software, and services. Um, they are focused predominantly on larger entities like British Petroleum, Airbus, Roche, Goldman Sachs, BMW, NEC, these are the kind of organizations that are more actively looking into quantum in terms of their capabilities. And you we talked, I think Rob mentioned about, you know, classical versus quantum. So very much interested in the hybrid capabilities that are available out there. So that's sort of the, uh, the vendor and the larger consumer side. Um, and a lot of the focus today is really around uh, proofs of concept, um, you know, how could we potentially use it against our largest and most difficult business cases or applications, um, whether that be things like optimization or drug design. Uh, so lots of different difficult applications where classical computers could theoretically not be able to solve that for a long period of time in trying to address those problems using a quantum computer or quantum technology. Great, and uh, Jeremy, we'll maybe come to you next to get your perspective and any follow-up comments you have on uh, on what Brian has said. Sure. Yeah. The what 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 I'm seeing is we're about maybe like two years away uh, in in the timeline that 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 we've got, um, and and yeah to go along with what Brian said, like right now we're in that like wild wild west phase of of the of the noise and the like the research the like what is this the surveying we're, we're all looking for that gold right now um and uh from our perspective the 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 biggest challenge right now is in the software it is it is in the difficulty and the challenge of actually writing software for quantum computers um but at the moment in terms of this hybrid area that we're in right now uh the the closest practical application today is around the quantum computing simulators. Uh, and, and with that, we're able to simulate uh, the quantum computing environment that it really gives us the, the first kind of taste at the, uh, at the uh, potentials right now. And John francois I see some nodding in agreement there. So uh, it seems like you might be thinking two years away to achieving a, a quantum advantage as well. What are, what are your thoughts on where we are in terms of practical applications? 
So yes, in a nutshell, I, I think it's two to three years away. So I, I used to round it up to 2025, 20, right? Um, so I think we, we, we demonstrated quantum supremacy in 2019, but it's, as, as everybody knows, it's, it's not a practical use case. There's a lot of debate, but, uh, you know, uh, well, so I think for our clients, what is really important is that now we, are, we get to a practical use case based on the signals we get, the, both the improvement in the hardware that we are seeing and the improvement of software that is coming along. Our expectation is that we will see one or even two or three use cases with quantum advantage by 2025. And of course, it will be a game changer because we, this will be the moment when we, we start to have ROI with quantum computing. And then we start, we can start really to scale up. So we, we, we are, yeah, uh, it's, it's really the moment that we are looking for. Mm. And so Dr. Campbell, a couple of your colleague panelists here are, are see things, I uh, see a quantum advantage in the, the next sort of two to three years. Do you agree? Do you have a different perspective or do you have a, perhaps a different take on uh, where we currently are with uh, practical applications? Always. <laughs> uh, I, I, okay. So, uh, my background is, again, out of uh, military, uh, national security. I've worked national security for decades, and my perspective is different. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, we've already talked about, um, you know, there's a debate about when you will have a universal fault-tolerant computer that's commercialized and available to, to the masses. Okay, that's one thing. Uh, another thing is uh, you have to consider nation states who are not going to be talking about what their current capabilities are. So I'm always thinking from a national security point of view. I'm always thinking from a security point of view. And if you have data, for example, um, that you want to keep private secret, whether it's intellectual property, digital secrets, national security secrets, whatever it is, then you have to know that those organizations and nation states and groups that are working on uh, quantum computing as a uh, national priority or as a priority of the organization, uh, whether or not they have uh, the capability this year, next year, or the year after is not relevant. They will have it. And therefore, all of the data that you have and you're putting out now is subject to um, cracking that data. So it will be available. So that's one perspective. Everything you put out there, if you want to keep it classified, you want to keep it secret, you cannot assume that it will be. So you can debate, you know, when you think practical quantum computers would be here, but you can't debate that if I've captured your information and you've got it encrypted with the current cryptography, you can't debate that I will not be able to decrypt it and, and have all of your secrets. So uh, from that standpoint, I, I, I don't, I don't necessarily follow you know, everything that everyone else is saying from a national security standpoint. The second point I wanna make is that the White House issued a memo, a national security memo to the government agencies, which includes all of the, the, the typical agencies, all of the government agencies, NSA, CIA, so on and so on and so on. And it says that within 180 days, you have to pr present a plan for mitigation of the quantum computing threats, right? As part of an SM uh, memo eight that came out in January. They have 180 days to come up with a plan. So therefore, somebody is seeing something somewhere and saying, hey, look, you have to take action now. So now I have a, a little bit different take on it. So it's not so much a, a matter of time. We need to be acting now from a from a securities perspective. So you you would agree with that? I, it, I I've been saying this for years. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's okay. that's the point. Okay. So I mean, as we look a bit into the future here, we've got a bit of a sense of where we currently are. We can maybe see a quantum advantage on the horizon. Um, so when we're looking at this ecosystem here, this broad ecosystem of talent and government entities and investors and consultants and business executives that sort of support the quantum ecosystem, and uh, Jean-Francois, maybe start with you on this one. Um, who, who do you see as maybe leading the charge uh, in terms of achieving that quantum advantage? 
first, first of all, uh, um, I, I really think, and again, based on a lot of discussions, that to achieve quantum advantage, the key will be hardware, right? Because right now, um, I mean, we need, we need far more qubits, far more fidelity, far more connectivity, far more coherence time. And, and that's block, uh, this is really the roadblock to, to get to quantum advantage. Because even if we get right now the best quantum algorithms, we know that, uh, as we mentioned, as was mentioned earlier, we can emulate, uh, you know, classically, a lot of the computers that are out there, right? And actually, most of them can do more, no more than 20 or even 100 operations. But that's what they can do right now, right? Even Google's quantum, you know, Sycamore computer um, uh, is limited in, in that regard. So really, what we need is, is, is quantum hardware that really breaks, um, you know, the, the compromise in terms of having more qubits and uh, more fidelity. There are a few contenders in this area. So let's say the more uh, promising could be Psi Quantum, because you asked me a name, right? So be, because they promised 1 million qubits by 2025, right? So, so even if you, if you have error correction in there, and of course, if with error correction, you, I mean, you, you don't have as many qubits because those are physical qubits, right? So, but even if you have a error correction in there, you could play with a lot of logical qubits. If again, if you achieve that. So that would be a company to watch for. Uh, and definitely, and there is, as you know, uh, close to half a, a million dollars last year. Billion, sorry. For exactly $450 million last year. Uh, another company who has a good potential, obviously, is, uh, is IonQ. Everybody knows about them. Uh, they, have a, they have a good roadmap and a good fidelity and, a, and, a, and stuff like that. And of course, I would watch for the, the main players, and the, uh, namely IBM, which is uh, right now the market leader. Uh, and they have a very robust roadmap uh, when you look at uh, what they promised they delivered. And so far, everything they, de they promised they delivered. So, <laughs> you know, touching wood, hoping, hoping they will, because uh, that would unlock a lot of things. So for me, hardware is really the key. And uh, yeah, there are a few players that have made interesting promises. So I hope that we will see them uh, become a reality. Yeah. So, so Jeremy, I'll go to you next. Do, do you agree with Jean-Francois? Do you see this as an issue where hardware is the roadblock and that's going to be the chief driver? Or is there something else that's maybe going to be pushing us uh, or accelerating us towards uh, achieving a quantum advantage in the near future? Well, uh, I, I agree, but I would also go to it's the software side. Uh, the software side is incredibly complicated um, and it's... Uh, misunderstood in a way because I, I, I feel a, a lot of the co uh, software companies right now are still taking a, a linear and binary approach to writing software for quantum computing, um, whereas it's a, it's a totally different approach to, uh, to writing software. Um, the, 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 the biggest um, hurdle I feel uh, is on an evolutionary level. Um, right now, the, the, the kind of emotional narrative is that humanity is over here and technology is over here, and we're afraid of what this can do to us and what it will take away from us. And so there's this like kind of conflict going on between that, but on an evolutionary level, when we are coming at it from the same kind of mountain, we see that we're evolving together. Uh, it, it's that that collaboration that's happening. I know that's kind of maybe a little less what you're expecting on an answer like that, but to me, that that there's like a symbio symbiosis happening there, and that's kind of what we're tackling. That's the resistance right now. Is like, is humanity ready for this level of computing power? Because it is a lot of power. We're, we're talking infinite computing power, yes. and human mind cannot comprehend. Uh, that limitlessness yet, and it fears it. And as yes. long as it fears it, we will we'll never bring it, we'll never land it to life because we're gonna be thinking that we're evolving on separate mountaintops here. Yes. And Dr. Campbell, it looks like you wanna jump in here in, in agreement. So why, why don't oh, you share your perspective? I think that was perfect uh, the way he put it. Uh, I, I just don't think everybody understands what the impact is of a quantum computing uh, how it works, 
how it can be used. It's only limited by our imaginations. We've never had anything like that uh, since we've been on this planet. Mm -hmm. it, it changes everything. Um, so I, I, I'd like to jump in on the hardware and software. So for example, you know, we are making progress. Uh, you know, if you look at IBM and there are, you know, Google and Microsoft, uh, there are a lot of players, Honeywell, a uh, bunch of players now, and then there are consortiums uh, uh, that, that are uh, Quantanium and so on that are jumping in uh, and, and making great progress. But if you look at uh, how we, we look at the semiconductor industry, transistors, you know, the integrated circuits, the progress that we make every year, you know, we got more and more capability. We're packing in more and more transistors. We're starting to see that now with quantum chips. Um, for example, if I look at the uh, IBM quantum roadmap, um, this year um, they've got uh, Osprey, which is 433 uh, quantum bits or qubits. And uh, so if you're familiar with uh, the significance of that is that uh, the number of quantum bits you have is an exponential speed up over any kind of classical super supercomputer. You can take the world's fastest supercomputer. Let's compare the world's fastest. It doesn't matter what, who it is or what, what it is right now. So let's say right now, uh, the, the fastest supercomputer has uh, the capacity at 433 uh, quantum bits. And, there, and we have a computer that has 433 quantum bits. Now, let's say I want to be able to double my capacity. Well, if I want to double my capacity in a supercomputer, that's really hard to do. It's not just simply, um, you know, uh, building another computer of, of the same uh, capacity. Uh, you have to be able to link them so that they work together. When we're talking about quantum bits, all I need to do is add one bit and I double my capacity. That's the power of a quantum speed up. That's exponential speed up. So if you think about two to the third, which is eight, right? And two to the fourth is 16. Two to the fifth is 32. Every bit you add, you double the capacity of your capacity to calculate and uh, come up with solutions. I, I don't know if visually if you can see how powerful that is. Um, you can't say that with any other computer. Only the quantum computers have that um, exponential speed up. The other part of it is also software is very important too. Um, Shor's algorithm and Grover's algorithm are, they're seminal, right? So th there are uh, ways that we approach problems that are totally different from how we looked at things in the past. So because of those algorithms, uh, we're, you know, NIST is coming out with new standards for cryptography because it's all broken. It's threatened with quantum computing. So all of that is going by the wayside. We're in new territory now. And the, uh, I, I think that there's always a lot of resistance from uh, segments of the population for various reasons uh, about where we are and where we're trying to go. We always have resistance but it's going to take people with open minds, uh, people with imaginations to help uh, further uh, humanity along. But uh, I, I agree with you know, what, what he said. That's perfectly the way he put it. So, so Brian, we'll, we'll come over to you for the last word on this topic. We, we, your, your panelists, your fellow panelists here have uh, talked about the importance of hardware of overcoming, you know, current roadblocks. Obviously, there's uh, a desire to sort of overcome that uh, perhaps fear of the technology and find harmony between technology and and uh, human enterprise. Uh, you know, what's your perspective? Where, where do you what do you see as being a, a main driver in terms of pushing us towards achieving a, a quantum advantage? Well, Scott, I'm going to bring it back to this year. And uh, fortunately, just uh, last week, I had the opportunity to moderate a good portion of the Quantum Business Europe um, uh, session that occurred. And there was about 25 people that I was interacting with during that thing, uh, during that session um, in various panels and so on. And um, by far, every single one of them talked about one issue. And that one issue was talent and getting access to a sufficient amount of talent in order to drive all the things that um, 
uh, Jean-Francois and Jeremy and Rob are talking about. And that is a major challenge for uh, hardware, software, services uh, providers. Um, and so there is a lot of work that's being done uh, or being identified to, to bring that talent about, whether it's from conventional computing to quantum or uh, net new. Um, uh, so, you know, we're seeing that um, as well uh, from a consumer side, benchmarks around quantum volume or qubits or algorithm efficiency are irrelevant. What they really want is understanding what the outcomes are. How do I benchmark against what I have today in terms of conventional systems? So how, could, how does it improve where I am today? Whether it's from a cost perspective and a speed or accuracy or other purpose or other reason. So, you know, we have to keep those things in mind. Quantum will be an incremental technology. It, we won't simply leap to the end. So what additional benefits can we get, whether it's true quantum or quantum inspired or some other uh, sort of format? Well, Brian, that's a great segue into our next topic here. Um, I mean, we've obviously been talking a bit about the kinds of solutions that exist currently. Um, and, you know, what we're seeing is, you know, classical computers with sort of a hybrid approach here uh, to achieve uh, something that's quantum inspired. So um, I'll, I'll actually go back to Rob with this one. So, you know, we know there's a lot of attention uh, being paid right now to applications, say, in the financial sector space or logistics supply chain problems or scheduling optimization problems. But are, are there other areas? Are there technology verticals, practical applications, or maybe some issue that's currently flying under the radar that's perhaps not top of mind that we should be paying more attention to? Uh, Dr. Campbell, what do you think? Oh, sure. Yeah, it's just endless. Um, as an example, artificial intelligence. One of the things that's been holding AI back is the, the, the lack of uh, real compute power uh, necessary to make it even more effective. An example, uh, for every branch and you have a decision that you need to make, you, all possibilities and all probabilities need to be considered. Well, in the real world, that's a tremendous calculation problem, and we just don't have that uh, compute problem in a classical computer. But with quantum bits, uh, you can consider all probabilities and all possibilities within the framework of that problem. So AI you know, will be uh, supercharged. Uh, if we look at uh, you know, something probably uh, uh, along the lines of healthcare uh, medicines, you know, you can uh, uh, model drugs uh, accurately uh, where you can't do it today because of classical computers uh, shortcomings. You can model drugs and you can model organs of, of a human body and you can actually watch the interaction of that drug with, with, with your DNA, with your chemistry. It's personalized to you. Uh, if you look at space travel, um, you look at uh, everything from logistics, right? Uh, you know, uh, what's the most efficient path? Uh, and unfortunately, on the, on the other side of the coin, uh, we know that uh, uh, they're being used for weapons as well uh, because of the tremendous uh, capacity to calculate. We know that the, uh, the National uh, Laboratory uh, 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 Los Alamos bought a D-Wave computer, uh, 5,000 qubit. That was several years ago. That was announced publicly. And who knows how many qubits uh, they're dealing with. Uh, with uh, D-Wave, you, you have a different type of computer called annealing, which is a different technique. But still, we found that annealing uh, could be used to crack the cryptography that protects the secrets that you have. So that's unexpected, or at least by, by some. Uh, so it's just wide open. Uh, we're only limited by our imaginations. That's it. So Jeremy, uh, with that thought in mind, we're only limited by our imaginations. Where, where do you perhaps, where does your imagination take you in terms of perhaps a, a practical application, a technology vertical or issue that we might be overlooking right now in this space? I think to, to bring this down to, to the most practicality, uh, imagination, it, it, I, that's definitely my language for it, but where I would steer 
you know, business owners or wh whoever might be watching this in terms of like thinking about practical applications, we're steering towards where you're currently being bottlenecked in intelligence. Um, and this, like just taking uh, what we were saying before, like logistics, uh, transportation, traffic flow, I don't have a lot of experience in that industry, but I can speak on the, on the broad strokes, big picture level that you are dealing with a lot of this data and you have this classical computing approach where you just add servers to get more power and, and it's very linear in that sense. But when you look at as where are you being bottlenecked in the intelligence, whether that's human intelligence or artificial intelligence, you're looking at what would you like to do? What, where are you being bottlenecked by the amount of permutations that you're trying to process all at once? Because as, uh, as Rob said, we're only limited in the imagination. So right now we think we're computing a lot of data with classical computers and all these permutations and all these possibilities of logistics and, and all of these things, but are there calculations that you would want to do if you could, if you could mix more unstructured data together, if you can bring in more data all at once, those are the type of questions that you wanna be asking how, at this stage of, of where we're at, not way down the line when we're talking like, uh, you know, two years, I'm talking about what you can do right now with your data to leverage it and to start to play with the quantum computing mindset. Because like I bring it back to humanity's fear of this is that it is going to take away a lot of the human work. This is why we have computers is to do the work for us. But with that, is we start to approach people's skills and expertise that they've been uh, going at for a lot of years. And with quantum computing, think about like, what if we could give your company 300 highly skilled employees? Like, what would you do with that? What would you do with 300 more employees? What would you do with 3000 more employees? That's what we're talking about is the, the work involved and the intelligence that you can garner from, from your data or whatever you're trying to accomplish. So, so Brian, I'm going to come to you next. And, um, you know, it's clear, you know, a, a couple of our, our, our panelists sort of, it, we're limited only by our, you know, imagination and our creativity in this space. Um, so, you know, what's your perspective? Is, is there an area where we're maybe not directing enough of our sort of uh, ingenuity and, uh, you know, thought power and creativity? Is there an area in this sort of practical um, application space that we should be maybe paying more attention to? Oh, I think you're on mute. I would say so, uh, particularly because a great deal of the attention has been uh, focused on financial services, transportation, and logistics. But I would suggest to you that chemistry is one of those areas where you've got conventional uh, problems and conventional solutions. But there is also that undiscovered country where you know things that we don't even know about that quantum is going to open up for us. There's a very interesting uh, consortium in Japan called QPARC, which is a consortium of 50 chemistry companies. And they are bringing their sort of shared resources together to apply quantum to those chemistry problems. And what they're going to discover, not only applying to what problems they're aware of today, but also what could be uh, identified simply because you have those quantum capabilities. And, and John Francois, we'll come to you for the last word on this. Um, you know, what's an area that you think maybe we're currently kind of overlooking or should be paying more attention to in this space? Uh, I think everybody is looking at uh, uh, a lot of applications. So I, I, I don't think there are areas that are really overlooked, but uh, let's say I, I would like to point out the, the, the benefits that quantum computing could bring in solving, uh, you know, the, one of the biggest challenge we have in front of us which is climate change, uh, because um, uh, it, it's, I mean, the, the, we can't simulate right now, and it has been discussed by other panelists, uh, simple molecular reactions. It, 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 we should be uh, ashamed that we still use today the same process to make fertilizer uh, for, for a century, right? 
uh, we didn't improve on that since since uh, a century ago. It was discovered in Germany by Haber and Bosch. It, uh, it consumed two to three percent of uh, world's natural natural gas. We know that nature is able to do it like for free. Uh, uh, we through an enzyme called uh, nitrogenase, but we we could we can't figure out how, how nature does does it so we can scale it and replicate in a in a factory setting and. Uh, and a quantum computer could, could help us do that. Could like we could rewind the reaction, understand what are the steps and uh, you know how, how it really works, and uh, and and that's just one problem. Uh, then we could look at uh, energy storage. We could look at uh, energy production. So those are. I mean, if we could solve those use cases, I mean, a lot of problems would 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 be uh, irrelevant. I think. And uh, so it's, it's really one area that I would I would love to see more um, resources and, and more research there. Well, thanks, Jean Francois. I mean, I think everyone is certainly in a bit of agreement here. We need to be thinking big because it, it really is only limited by our imagination. Uh, Jeremy, I'm going to come to you for our next sort of topic. Um, as as we look to the future here of uh, achieving, you know, possibly achieving a quantum advantage. Um, we can naturally expect uh, more adoption, more innovation in sort of the quantum computing technology space, generally speaking. Um, but how are existing technologies going to fare? Brian made the point earlier that we can expect to see incremental changes. Um, and is that going to be the case? Can, should, we, should current sort of existing uh, technology, is it going to be more in a adapting and incorporating kind of approach? Or perhaps it's going to be the case that we're just going to see certain technology verticals just at risk of going obsolete. Or, or is it going to be, to one of your earlier points, uh, is it just going to be the wild, wild west of uh, disruption? So what, what's your perspective? How do you think sort of current technology is going to fare as we see more and more adoption of uh, quantum computing technology? Hmm. Well, like any emerging technology, it is going to disrupt and and call into uh, question the efficiencies of of any old uh, old approach, um, and those those that will survive are the ones that are going to change and adapt to the new conditions. Um, but in certain cases, when we're talking about you know artificial intelligence and and the 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 capabilities of of, of some of these things. Uh, uh, some of these old older technologies uh, won't be necessary anymore. Um, so, yeah, that, that that's kind of what, how how I see it. it. It's it'll be like any other emerging technology that has come into civilization uh, that some things aren't necessary anymore, and some things just need to change to be up to speed with with where this new technology is at. Um, but I do see a lot of the inefficient structures and systems that we've got will fall away uh, because they're just in an evolutionary sense, they're just not needed anymore. Right. So yeah, go ahead, Dr. Campbell. Yeah, I'd like to add if I could on that, because uh, I, I thought about this uh, in the, my experience. Uh, I have uh, like students who, uh, of course, they're in the, these topics like AI and, and quantum mechanics. And what I tell them all is forget about what you think you know, because it's only going to get in your way. And, and what I mean by that is, so for example, a lot of people are still stuck on Newtonian physics, Einstein's physics. They say things like, uh, uh, you can't go faster than the speed of light. And what that does, if that's part of your, your mind, set as part of your the way that you're approaching a problem, then it's going to dictate how you go after that problem and what your possible possible outcomes could be. So if you forget about what you think you know, forget all of this stuff that you you know you think you know, and you come at it with just it's wide open, right? This is something that we've never seen before. You know, we, we're not limited about what People said in the past, what, oh, you can't do this and you can't do that. All of that's wrong. Just forget about that. So we need to get our workforce, we need to get our mindsets uh, adjusted 
uh, we need to start thinking in new ways. And it's not easy, but I, I think in order for us to take advantage of this, we're going to have to do it. And you're not going to find many people that are going to be doing that. But for those who do it, um, they're going to be the game changers. And, uh, you know, Jean-Francois, what, what's your perspective on this? Um, you know, is this, a, a, do, we, do we need to just throw out what we kind of know to really embrace uh, quantum computing? Um, is it more of sort of an incremental approach and, and adapting, or is it a bit of everything in terms of, uh, you know, how sort of our current approaches and thinking with respect to technology might fare in the future? Um, I think it's a bit of both. Uh, I've been long enough in the IT industry, for example, to tell you that uh, main, mainframes that people said 20, 30 years ago that would go away, they are still there today, right? I know banks that, that, that use mainframes and they are still up and running and uh, doing, doing well besides beside their age. And people would say, we can't find people developing on COBOL, but it actually is not true. So COBOL programs are, are still there. The humanity tends to add things in layers. So I, I, my opinion is that the current computing power that we have will not go away. We continue to carry on and we'll add a quantum layer on top of it. And, uh, it will bring a new, brand new capability. It will improve on what we already have, but uh, I don't think we will throw away the supercomputers we, we have because also they are very complementary. Uh, uh, try to do two plus two on the quantum computer, right? Uh, you might get 4.1, you know? <laughs> so, uh, or, or play Netflix. Uh, so, I mean, quant uh, classical computers will be great at what they do. Uh, quantum computers will augment them. And yes, the, the sky is the limit in terms of combining them, but uh, I don't see the old tech going away just because uh, I've been told, and I mean, I'm in IT for a long time. Um, the, the mainframe will still be there in, uh, in uh, 10 or 20 years, mark, mark, mark my words, so, <laughs> you know. So, Brian, I'll, over to you for the last comment on this. I mean, it seems pretty clear we need to have a, a sort of a bit of an adoption mindset uh, in line with your earlier comments about incremental change. So can you maybe expand on that? How do you maybe, yes. what's your sort of vision in terms of how we're going to in, incrementally adopt uh, advances in quantum computing technology? Well, Jean-Francois gave a lot of great examples of traditional you know, technology that's come before quantum. But um, in every technology buying decision, there's a human being. And we have pioneers, we have early adopters, we have late adopters, and we have laggards. Those companies are not going to move forward with quantum at the same pace. They just are not. So you know there are going to be pioneering companies who start to leverage the quantum capabilities in whatever form they are today. We see the example of Multiverse and Kexa Bank who are already getting some early, early uh, results from their quantum inspired um, le um, calculations and algorithms. Um, but there are hundreds of thousands of other companies who in 2025 are gonna be asking the question, what's quantum? And you know, if that's the case, there are going to be lots of pioneers and early adopters who are gaining that kind of advantage. So the technology is gonna be incremental, but so is the acceptance or adoption by those people who are consuming or buying. And sort of sticking with this same theme, uh, Brian, as we, as we sort of have an eye to the future and we start thinking about 2025, three, four, five years down the road, maybe achieving a quantum advantage. What, what should companies be doing today to better position themselves to realize the benefits from a quantum advantage or to position themselves to be able to leverage um, real quantum computing power? Yeah, a great question. The first question they should stop asking is when will quantum advantage arrive? Um, they need to be asking, when should I start? And that answer is now. Uh, so they need to start building out their infrastructure, their talent, their, their vendor relationships, um, people who they trust inside the quantum ecosystem, maybe joining a consortium to upgrade their learning capability, um, um, whether it's a QEDC or a QUIC or a Quantum Industry Canada or QPARC. Um, so ways that they can start to gain insights into what's really going on. Um, maybe take advantage of the QEDC marketplace where they can actually hear from vendors on 
what they're actually offering today in the marketplace and with who, which companies. So there are lots of things that individual uh, business leaders can do today to think about how they're going to adopt quantum. So Dr. Campbell, the, the message from Brian is clear. We need to be really starting today. Um, certainly that ties into some of your earlier comments about uh, security risks. So, so what's your perspective? Well, like what do we need to be doing today to help prepare for you know, a future in, in uh, quantum technology? Oh, oh, sorry, Dr. Campbell, I think you're on mute. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I, I follow along uh, with those comments. I, I think that, first of all, we need a foundation um, to which to understand this first. You have to have some understanding of what we're talking about uh, in order to make good choices, decisions, ask good questions. You have to understand what we're talking about. And I think that's where we need to start because th this uh, science is so mysterious, wondrous, uh, and baffling, and, and, and all of these things all wrapped together. And I, I don't think that many people really realize what we're talking about. We're talking about technology, right? And granted, you don't need to understand the internet to be able to use the internet. But if you're in a position where you want to leverage this in some kind of way, financially for your business, or, or you're just trying to solve a problem, you have to understand the fundamentals of what we're talking about. Uh, and I don't think a lot of people think about that. Uh, and just one quick example, uh, this is something we've been doing for decades and decades, right? So if you think about your elementary, middle school mathematics, for example, uh, you think about the square root of a negative number or a negative one, what's the square root of that? Well, you can't solve it in today's 3D realm. You, it can't be solved. So what they realize is, well, wait a minute, it has to be another dimension that we can't perceive uh, that will make this work. And we use this every day in electronics, uh, control theory, uh, everything, all the technologies that you see, we use complex numbers. And what that means is that there is a dimension where the math comes out right. You can't get the square root of minus one, right? And in, in a regular math system, there's another dimension. So we're accessing that every day for technology, but we don't quite understand what's happening. We, or most of us don't think about it. There's another dimension that we're accessing. Same thing for quantum computers. We're talking about accessing not only another dimension, but another universe. What, what does that mean? But what's another universe? And, and that's, you know, I, I'm just a fundamentals type of guy. I, I just think you got to understand fundamentals. Great. Well, thank you for that. So, Jeremy, we'll go to you next. We, we've heard of the importance of talent. We've, we're, now we're understanding just the importance of having that sort of fundamental uh, knowledge to sort of really understand what we're getting ourselves into. Um, you know, what, what's your perspective? Where, where, what do you think, um, you know, what, what do we need to be doing now to help kind of position ourselves uh, to better take advantage of, uh, you know, future advances in quantum computing? Yeah, to, to build off of everything I'm in agreement with what was brought up there. And I go back to the imagination here and, and the creativity uh, and would offer looking at it from the fundamentals, of course, the talent, but it's assessing the, the big picture of just take the variables of, of speed, of accuracy, and complexity of work as just like maybe the three basic variables there. And look at where you exist, where, where you currently exist with that, where you're being, where, where, where you're being bottlenecked, like I brought up before, and what it would be cool to do if you could, and kind of take that survey on where you want things to be faster, where the, where things are slow right now, uh, where more accuracy would benefit, um, and also 
what sort of it, going to that imagination that like bigger vantage point of 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 more possibilities what complexities are you currently shying away from because you don't have the current compute power to even you know think about processing right now because of the just the complexity but looking at it from this data and imagination perspective we're looking at the vision of what where you would want to go if you could that's the the starting point here is if you could what would you do and where would you want things faster more accurate and to handle more complexity great thank you jeremy that's certainly some sage advice we definitely need to have a, a bit of a clearer picture in terms of where we want to go. And uh, Jean-Francois, I'm going to come to you for the last word here, and then we'll go to some questions from the audience out there. So uh, Jean-Francois, what, what's your view? What, what do you think we need to be doing today to help kind of better position ourselves to, to leverage advantages in quantum technology in the future? So, yeah, so, so, so first I, I, I go with uh, Dr. Campbell here and say that uh, we need to think about uh, the cryptography threat, cryptographic threat and this is urgent because uh, it could be uh, RSA 2048 could be broken as soon as 2030. And uh, as Dr. Campbell pointed out, you can already, you can have attacks like store now, decrypt later, uh, as you heard about. Uh, and also we know from past uh, painful migrations that uh, it takes time to upgrade your security systems, uh, certificates, protocol, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so um, we, ad we are advising uh, our clients to, to look at the migration right now. It might be mandated by NIST by 2030. And uh, if it takes like more than five years, I mean, it's going to be soon. So, so it's, one thing is to, to think about this threat. You don't need a quantum computer. Uh, you need to implant, implement, uh, you know, protocols called PQC, which means post-quantum, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, computing uh, protocols, so very, 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 basically they will replace RSA with a more robust um, mathematics, right? But it, it's a no-brainer, and I think everybody should uh, should look at it because everybody uses crypto, so everybody is concerned. So that's that, that's one, one thing. Then, uh, of course, um, the, the the companies the reaction should be differentiated by the impact on, on the industry. So for example, if I take two extremes, if you're in retail, right, you're, you're Walmart, you're not so aff affected by quantum computing in your day-to-day -day operations. Yes, maybe you could improve your logistics a little bit, but there are so many constraints that you need to take into account, uh, the, uh, you know, including union rules and stuff like that, that, uh, you know, uh, even a quantum computer could not necessarily uh, improve that. So you're not, you're not that impacted. On the other end, if you take uh, chemicals, pharma, uh, or financial services, you're more impacted. There are a lot of uh, use cases in your industry. So I would say that, uh, uh, of course, it, it really depends on the industry you're in. Um, we did a paper last year, so where we, we, we basically looked at all the, all the use cases. So it gives a map, basically, of uh, you know, uh, where, uh, where the impact should be. But, uh, Clearly, uh, if you're if you're involved in chemicals, if you're if you're if you use mathematics a lot, like like financial services, you know, uh, um, uh, then you you should be you should be starting down the journey, preparing because three years you could say oh it's a long term, but it's actually uh, not not so not so long because uh, there are so many steps to get prepared. You need to find the right partners. You need to identify the right use cases. You need to gather the data. You need to look at the software. I mean, there are so many steps you need to prepare. So let's say our most advanced clients that are impacted, yes, they, they, they look at this. Those who are in, you know, in non-impacted sectors, uh, they will probably wait and see if, uh, if something is, is valuable for them, but it's less, less urgent, I would say. Okay, well, very good. Well, thank you for that. Um, that does wrap up the formal part of the discussion. We do have some questions from the audience, which we'll jump to now. So the first question, uh, open to anyone, any of the panelists, does anyone see a real chance of an upcoming quantum winter? The hype is big, but, but can quantum computing fulfill the expectations? Anyone want to take a stab at that? Uh I, I think uh, um, I, it's a question I get often, and uh, I, I think there's a non-zero chance. 
So uh, uh, it's really difficult to quantify. Maybe it's five, maybe it's ten percent chance that you know we we fail to have uh, achievement in the hardware that I was men mentioning. Uh, 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 that doesn't mean so we could have a quantum in terms in terms of uh, like a pause or let's say uh, yeah uh, uh, a lull in the interest or in quantum computing, right? Uh, that doesn't mean that the long-term prospects of quantum computing are bad because you have to keep in mind that a lot of money has been poured in the sector. The best and brightest minds are working on it. Last year alone, 1.7 billion of private equity money has been raised. And I'm not counting the money from IBM, Microsoft, Amazon that are not in this uh, amount of money, right? Uh, so that give us, uh, plus the government uh, money, right? Uh, so uh, uh, long-term, I'm optimist. There might be uh, a period where we have a few setbacks. We, for example, we don't, you know, increase the number of qubits as we, as we, as we anticipated we would. Or fidelity gets stuck at, for example, 99.9, right? For, for some time. But uh, so, and yeah, we could say it's a quantum winter in a way that, Definitely to the, you know, uh, create a lull uh, and some pause. But uh, long term, I'm, I'm I'm optimistic. Just because, uh, I mean, again, so many money and the, so many the bright minds are on this. But uh, and we know there there's no, I mean, there's no reason that it cannot work. The, the physics are clear; it it can be done. And actually, when you look at when you, when we were in 80, 18. Uh, 18, sorry, 1980, when he started, 40 years after, what a great achievement, right? So. It, well, it's, too, it's too big to fail, in other words. <laughs> well, well in, uh, in, in 1900, Lord, Lord Calvin, who was a, a physicist uh, of, of some renown, said that uh, physics was over in 1900, right? All, all we really need to do is just uh, be more precise in our measurements, and that was it. But I, I would say that uh, quantum mechanics is the most successful science uh, that this planet has ever seen. Uh, everything that you know you see around you, all the electronics, uh, uses principles of quantum mechanics. You know, from everything from the you know Einstein, he got a, a Nobel Prize for the Compton uh, effect. Uh, we have quantum tunneling for electronics and all the electronics that you see, your cell phone, your television, everything, it ha uses quantum principles. Uh, we just, you know, people just don't realize that we use this science every day. And it's not, uh, you know, it's not a, uh, uh, a futuristic uh, science fiction uh, tale. Uh, the second thing I would say is that the U.S. government, U.S. White House has directed the U.S. government to prepare for quantum computing attacks and, and uh, the adopting the uh, post-quantum cryptography that NIST is uh, going to standardize here in the next uh, year or two. They're going to release standards for uh, post-quantum cryptography, which is going to change everything because m most people don't have any idea how it works. And they don't, you know, I'm not going to get into that, but... So it's going to change everything. Uh, it takes a lot of time, a lot of planning, a lot of strategy to understand this. You have to understand what are we talking about if I say, look, all of your cryptography in your enterprise, in your government, uh, in your household, it's going to have to be changed. What, what does that mean? You're going to have to use this new stuff that uh, NIST says, you know, is going to help protect against a quantum computer. But, but how does it impact my hardware? How does it impact my software? Uh, will it work, with, you know, in a hybrid fashion? Or do I have to replace everything? All of these things have to be laid out. And it takes time, time, lots of time. You have to understand it first. And that's my, my, my concern is that, you know, I, I like to see more of an effort, uh, you know, a coordinated effort, international if necessary, uh, academia, private sector, the government working together as a priority. This should be one of the highest priorities that we have on the planet. And uh, of course, coming from my background, um, I look at it from security perspective. None of your digital secrets will be safe. None of them. And I can, you know, in your bank account, your intellectual property, 
Uh, anything you can think of that you want to keep safe will not be safe. And I'm not going to tell you if I'm a group that has this capability, if I'm a nation state, I'm a government, I'm not going to tell you that I've got it. So we have to understand this. And I, I, that's my concern. Okay, and we are basically, we are pretty much out of time, but I do want to give Jeremy and Brian a quick final word here. So Jeremy, maybe 15 seconds <laughs> or less. Um, do you think a quantum winter is coming? Yes or no? Uh, only if we uh, continue to approach it from a, a, a binary or a dualistic point of view. That, that's, that's what's going to hold us back. Okay, and, and Brian, same question to you, uh, if you can give us a, a short answer. I understand the nature of the question. There were three artificial intelligence winters over a period of about 50, 60 years. Um, but from a quantum perspective, um, I'm hoping that governments, um, certainly to Rob's point, and um, venture capitalists have expectations that are in line with the actual development of quantum over time. Great, thank you very much. Well, unfortunately we have, I, I mean, I do see there's more questions uh, in the chat here, but unfortunately we are out of time. So I just wanna take a moment to thank all our panelists today. Certainly uh, a very informative discussion. I know I learned a lot and I hope our, our audience uh, learned a lot as well today. Uh, so on behalf of Dead Cat Live Cat, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, super fun conversation and uh, we look forward to uh, hosting more webinars and, and hope you all can join us again at some time in the future. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thank Great. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.